So uh, my name is Shelby Mosier. I am a um, I'm an analytic philosopher. So I do aesthetics, but I I teach philosophy of games, and so I empathize with the idea that aesthetics courses aren't necessarily the thing that students want to take. But I consider myself uh, lucky in that I don't have to sneak it aesthetics into them. They have to take my courses. So I teach in a division of games, mostly for practice or those who want to practice and make games. So I teach theory courses. And so they have to take my courses, um, both undergraduates and graduate students. And I'm also an adjunct in the philosophy department. So I get a combination of undergrad game students and undergrad philosophy students, and then graduate uh, game students. So that's a little bit about what my background is. Um, and I, what I'm presenting today is, um, I, it's basically a summary of the kinds of topics I would teach over the whole semester. So I'm summarizing all of that into kind of a, a brief talk. And I would probably also teach a lot of these things over different courses, not just in one single course. But kind of like we were just talking about with John's talk and Arnold's talk, you know, between film and music, there are so many opportunities to get aesthetics in and talk about interesting conversations uh, while using a sort of popular medium or format to be able to um, present that. So I'm going to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint. And... Instead of Google, let's see. Okay. Get my stations set up here. Okay, so video games can just simply entertain us, right? They help us simply pass the time as well. But more than mere entertainment, video games can also be meaningful. So their rule sets, narratives, art assets, and interactive outcomes can provide meaningful and profound aesthetic value to our everyday lives. And we've just been talking about everyday aesthetic experiences. But also games are excellent tools for exploring various philosophical discussions. Um, and the meaningfulness of play is not the least of these. And I think it's because of the sociality, but I'll talk about that. So we're going to be looking at some ways in which video games can be useful uh, in teaching aesthetics. And I'll consider specifically how video games can teach relevant topics within aesthetics, such as ontology, uh, value theory, aesthetic appreciation, and ethics. But first, just like with my students, uh, how can play teach us anything and why is it important? Simply put, everyone plays. Play is something animals and humans do from a very early childhood through adulthood. Play is so inherent to our livelihood and our everyday lives that we do it unscriptedly and almost reflexively, uh, such as when maybe a cat will chase her tail, uh, a student will twiddle their thumbs mindlessly, or maybe even a child will skip from one room to another instead of merely walking. Play is both natural and fundamental to us, so much so that it's been discussed by ancient Greeks who dedicated significant portions of time discussing the value of play and questioning if and how it can lead to the good life, so to speak. And if so, how can play factor in comparison to more serious activities such as philosophizing, for example, or justice? Play is also taken up by modern thinkers Modern thinkers continue the research into play, but even social scientists who have no difficulty in understanding play with animals and humans, or to say child, uh, humans during childhood, continue to be puzzled about what play means for adults. Though there's a lack of data when it comes to play and adults, it's clear we still participate in play on a regular basis. Whether you and another colleague bond over telling jokes, say on Tuesdays during lunchtime, or you unwind by playing more cerebral games after work like chess or Sudoku, or if you're like me and do role-playing games like Baldur's Gate. Historically, we know play is important, so much so that there's a long history of humans creating objects 
that will further help us to facilitate play in more directive and purposive ways. So for example, sticks become swords, balls get thrown and caught, and ropes get skipped. All of these things are play or actions that are free, voluntary, and unbound by rules. We move from pure play to game play when we create rules around such objects and activities for more precise games that facilitate different activities, such as throwing the balls into designated nets or moving tokens we call bishops from one square to another. Not only are rules essential for games, they also individuate them. So for example, consider running in your lane to, finish, to the finish line is one sort of sport, but by changing just one of the constitutive rules, such as running in your lane towards the finish line, but while tied to the leg of your teammate, you've created a whole new game. Notice so far we've engaged in an ontological practice to distinguish between two kinds of play that we can call game play and pure play. So rules differentiate between game play and play, and they are also the identity bearing feature that differentiate one game from another. So here's where you can engage uh, in an ontological discussion of game individuation. Again, you have to be sneaky with the word ontology in students. Um, and identity we actually by actually playing a game, loosely following the rules of the exquisite corpse game invented by the surrealists and Dadists. So the way the game, or if you want to call it a game originally worked was mostly through poetry, where you would have a collaborative effort. effort. So you might have a number of individuals or groups, and they would each write a line of a poem. And you would follow a loose set of rules, perhaps like um, uh, adjective, noun, verb, adjective, noun. And so one person or group would write a line of a poem, then they would um, conceal that line and hand it off to someone else, and then they would write a poem, a line to the poem, adding to it. And they would continue to conceal and reveal uh, portions of it uh, until everybody had participated. And at the end, you end up with this very collaborative and sometimes oddly elegantly put together uh, uh, poetry. And you can see with this image here, it was also done with the visual arts um, in a collaborative effort. So the way I use this, um, this exercise for my students is I will have them devise rule sets for games. So if it's a more smaller seminar style format, I might have them do this individually. If it's a larger lecture class, I'll do it uh, putting them in groups. And then the way it works is I ask them to uh, write uh, two rules to a simple game they could play in the classroom. So they have to be relatively simple. And they write each rule on a separate line. And then that first individual or group will cover just that top rule, leaving only that second rule exposed. And then they hand off that rule to the next group. And then seeing only that second rule exposed, they write what a follow-up rule should be based on the rule they can see. And they keep doing this and passing it along until everybody's participated. And at the end, you reveal the whole rule set to the class. And surprisingly, sometimes the rules are quite elegant. Oftentimes they're also quite ludicrous, right? But the point really either way is to show how game identity relies on the exact set of prescribed constitutive rules and importantly teaches ontology through play, uh, I think while playing through social and collaborative interactions. So far I've been talking about play and gameplay more broadly, uh, whether tabletop board games or sports played on a field or track. Video games also follow um, rules for gameplay and they allow for pl pure play as well. When we play games, we follow rule sets. The same is true with video games, but the rules are automated and generated by the game's algorithm, which prescribes specific actions from players that in turn generate certain outcomes. Rule-based actions constitute a kind of gameplay, but pure play, as I said, is also possible, is ungoverned by rules. Uh, while playing video games, I can decide, just like with all games, to be playful within those constraints or rule sets. That's because video games consist of ludic activities, narr narrative activities, and other procedural moments, which are all governed by rules. But I've left an important thing out so far. To play a game, we must adopt the right attitude, or what's commonly referred to as the illusory attitude. Voluntarily adopting a illusory attitude prevents non-game actions that are also governed by rules from constituting as a game, 
such as say everyday things like budgeting, following a recipe, or maybe even just driving instructions. We don't tend to engage in these rule governed activities with a ludic attitude because engaging with those sorts of things, we do want to be as efficient as possible and eliminate as many obstacles as possible. With games, however, we're meant to want to experience the obstacles or there's nothing to play. Okay, now by adopting a illusory attitude, that also means we can be playful and think and taking up certain rules. It's easy to think about less constraining rule bound games like Twister or Telephone and other party games that perhaps allow for pure play within the gameplay. But let's think about chess for a moment because chess is a game highly governed by rules. While my actions might be highly constrained by these rules because certain tokens can only move in certain directions among other rules, I might also choose to play within those rules by voluntarily choosing to play those rules as either elegantly as possible, maybe selecting from a strategy or just maybe by being silly. Maybe I'm acting out the rules and voicing out the rules of the king and queen and bishop and so on in a performative manner. Now, the rules don't prescribe that I do this, uh, but I just might choose to do so given my attitude and the environment that I'm playing in. My decision uh, to be playful resembles the actions of a child who rolls around in the mud or kids who play make-believe, which is the kind of um, ungoverned, non-rule-bound play, but it's nested within the rule-bound uh, rule following gameplay. Here, there are many uh, different texts. Here's just a few on the slide uh, that uh, explore aesthetics um, and the idea of performers versus players, art versus instrumentality, and the like. So that's what pure play is, and that's what gameplay is, and how video games can accommodate both. Taking a closer look at video games uh, more specifically, Video games fit into one of two very broad categories, games for entertainment or serious games. Entertainment games might allow players to overcome obstacles, maybe by solving puzzles as a platformer game, hitting targets like with first person shooters, uh, maybe also engaging with complex characters and narratives such as role playing games. These are meant to be fun or engaging, but that's not to diminish the artistry or mechanics uh, of these games. It's simply that these games are marketed for popular mass consumption to be enjoyable, but there's lots of aesthetic tools still to be um, uh, found in these. Um, all these things, all things being equal, serious games allow for similar mechanics, and they also do aim to be equally engaging, but further direct players to what's also called critical play where the primary goal goes beyond mere entertainment to perhaps teach a skill, hone a talent, improve memory, or cultivate pro-social behavior. Empathy is often a common one of the, the pro-social behaviors. In other words, serious games uh, like these um, video games are intended for what's characterized as critical play. They are meant to be persuasive in its goals, whatever the, those goals may be. Uh, for easier instructional purposes, there are plenty of tabletop serious games that also offer critical play and instructional moments if video games aren't as handy. So here are just three of many to choose from. They're, they're becoming quite uh, increasingly popular. So Career Moves is a repurposed game based on the board, board game of life, which we've all played at one point or another. Um, but instead of the, the normal rules or the rules pertaining to life, players must choose marginalized careers and, circum and circumstances for their female characters in order to make a point about inequities in the workplace. McDonald's video game is played to make the most profit while benefiting the environment as much as possible. Those are your two goals in gameplay. Uh, after playing, a player, player starts to realize that both of these are incompatible. So the more you profit, the looser your grip is on the environment, et cetera. So these are two rule bound, uh, highly rule bound examples. For an example of an RPG or a role playing game, uh, Sign is an excellent game to um, teach about being understood uh, or the frustrations therein, I should say. This game is based on historical events in Nicaragua in the 1970s which led to a group of deaf children being taken to a camp where none of them could communicate with each other. So no sign language was in place and nothing was taught. 
They took matters into their own hands, uh, literally, and created their own sign language. So with this game, you need to communicate with each other without speaking. So there's no speaking involved. Um, using um, no verbal cues, but some there are some signs that are involved to create your own language. It's frustrating, it's funny, and the gameplay indicates, indicates how frustrating and rewarding uh, this process must have been for the children in Nicaragua. It's a great classroom uh, game to play. Both entertainment games and serious games push artistic and technological boundaries, and both can offer complex and rich aesthetic experiences. So we've mentioned genre already in some of the previous talks. Initially, our first aesthetic encounter with a video game is through its genre, even before you play it. Like literature, film, and music, there are perceptual features that are immediately recognizable as belonging to one genre or another. And likewise, a game's genre has features that are unambiguous, and these standard perceptual features are what direct our artistic and aesthetic appreciation. Traditionally, we call these certain features pertaining to a genre either standard, variable, or contrastandard. Video games are useful in teaching aesthetics because with them, we encounter many different kinds of perceptual features uh, all at once. So this is the sights, the sounds, and procedural outcomes that occur throughout the game. Standard features are those we are accustomed to perceiving with certain genres. So let's just back away from games for a second to consider this bird. It has enough features that are standard to a bird that automatically direct our sense-making skills to appropriately see this thing as a bird. These features are immediately clear and unambiguous, and the same is true with games. So if I showed you this image, and it admittedly is pretty dark, but in game it's also dark, it's intended to have this. I think I'm gonna have to share my um, sound. Let me figure out how to um, do that while I say. So if you look at the features, whatever you can make out from the, uh, the darkness of this image, even without playing it, without ever encountering it, this is obviously just a still. The features give us enough, enough information, hopefully, to probably assume this is some sort of horror game, right? And even with the features you have, again, static features, you probably have a sense of the kinds of sounds or the musical score that might accompany it, right? So even if games isn't your thing, we've all read literature, we've all listened to music, we've all seen film, right? So if you have any idea in your mind of what this music might sound like, see if this kind of agrees with your idea. Visual standard features, audio features, right? Those are all directing us to understand exactly and precisely what genre this is coming from. And we're not even playing. And then contrast that with a different game, such as this one, right? Clearly, we have a different set of standard features that are directing our attention and hopefully guiding our appreciation. So if horror is not your thing, you might be more drawn to this simply by looking at an image um, of this game. And I presume, even if you don't know the exact musical score for a game like Trine, you probably can anticipate what it might sound like. I do love that soundtrack. Uh, it's it's excellent to work to you when you want a little background music, but nothing too distracting. So again, everything um, uh, that we perceive in both of these games is pretty immediate and unambig unambiguous, making the genres relatively clear. The fewer the standard features that are apparent, the less the genre would be clear to us. So standard features are expected given the genre. Variable features are features that have no bearing on our sense-making abilities. Right, so back to the bird. If I had chosen a bird with feathers that were completely black, we probably wouldn't be any less tempted to see this as an image of a bird, right? Because in the case of this uh, scenario anyway, color is variable. It could be any one or a combination of colors and we would still view this as a bird. 
because the standard features are still doing the heavy lifting here. Now that's not to say color is always a variable feature, right, which is obvious and with certain objects or certainly within um, different categorical times of art history um, where color is in this case standard. So um, colors can be variable, right, uh, such as here, and they also can be um, standard. But what happens if we have something like this, right? Blue is standard, not variable for uh, something like blueberries. But if all of a sudden we have this bit here, it takes us by surprise. So those are neither standard or variable. These are what we call contra standard features. Okay, we've been looking at this image and while the colors are impressive, they don't give us pause, right? The colors are standard enough to bird. But what if we look at an image like this? If I asked you what was strange about the image of this bird, most of us would say something about the mustache-like feature because it's uncommon. Uh, what is known to aesthetics as a contrastandard feature. Contrastandard features are odd if perceived within a certain category. Uh, they allow us to do some rule breaking in interesting ways. This is incredibly interesting for game developers, I believe. If done well, these features surprise us and often keep us talking about our aesthetic experiences with art. That's especially uh, true of games. Ideally, you're, you're thinking and talking about these games well after you've played them and maybe you're even returning to play them. And this is true of uh, many serious games such as the one we've talked about and these ones uh, presented here. Another way a games can be useful in teaching uh, as a teaching tool for aesthetics is through narrative. And there are games called RPGs that give a heavily narrative-based account for their games. And interactivity makes them a function that uh, makes them function very differently than other narrative-driven media, such as traditional literature, theater, or film. So the outcomes of video game RPGs can vary so drastically from one playing to another, which would alter the identity of traditional media. But the varying outcomes of RPGs don't compromise the identity of the game, as we mentioned at the beginning with our ontology exercise. Each different outcome can still constitute the same game. Uh, and those who play role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons or Baldur's Gate know that decisions bear on the structure of the story and the characters. So here's the difference to think about with games, right? When you play basketball or chess, the game ends in either a win or a loss for their players. With the traditional arts, when you read Romeo and Juliet, it will always end with the death of our two main characters or it's not an authentic version. In each scenario, we might feel things, different things based on um, the properties or outcomes. And we might feel differently with each encounter of those things. But with RPGs, the decisions you make for your character do not just result in a win or a loss. And they don't always end in that exact outcome like with Romeo and Juliet. Those decisions change the behavior of the characters, they affect the narrative structure and the outcomes in which the structure of Romeo and Juliet cannot support. If 10 people play Baldur's Gate, for example, which is an RPG video game, each will have a very different story that unfolds because of their unique decisions. If each plays through the game once more time, their set of outcomes will vary drastically once again. Here we have an opportunity to ask if Baldur's Gate is a single game, how can each playing of that game with so many different outcomes and aesthetic properties have enough shared aesthetic properties between each other for us to identify it as the single game? Again, if Romeo survives the end of our play, we can be sure we read a different structure because Shakespeare did not allow for significant structural changes, even where minor artistic ones might vary in the performances. While we may have different aesthetic experiences each time we read a novel or watch a film, none of those variances affect the structure of the work. This points to the significance of interactivity and a profound impact that it might have on the aesthetic properties of the work in comparison to more traditional works. Now, it's not that video games have better or more aesthetic or artistic properties than the traditional arts, but their aesthetic and artistic properties are derived and encountered very differently. The traditional arts direct our attention to the properties of the object oftentimes, be it a painting, sculpture, play, or musical work, in as much as we can think about the objecthood of these art forms. Since the ancient Greeks, art practices and appreciation have elevated the individual author, 
the singular object and the intended and settled properties that the objects might bear. We appreciate these works from a distance, be it in a museum or on the stage. Of course, singular objecthood has had its challenges as well, such as the variations and versions of a musical score, adaptations of plays, etc. But still, most of aesthetics has handled such challenges within one object-oriented theory or another, making interactive works seemingly less adequate. That's because such object-oriented theories ignore the distinctive features of interactive art, leaving some of these features unaccounted for. For example, when I ask my students to play a game in class, and perhaps it's one of the um, video games I've already shared or the tabletop uh, role-playing games that's easier to access. So when I ask them to play, um, I observe and um, sort of listen to how the kind of language they are talking about um, and the processes that they have. Uh, when they're explaining it, none of the object-based accounts really account for their experiences or the type of properties that unfold uh, because of their decisions. If there are any perhaps more promising theories that can account for the important aesthetic properties in video games, a process-oriented account seems perhaps a little bit more appropriate. Uh, this account suggests that some works direct our aesthetic attention inwardly rather than outwardly to any specific object. So while objects still may be relevant to our appreciation, and video games certainly do have important formal properties to um, attend to, uh, those aesthetic properties become almost secondary to the process uh, granted by the interactions and critical reflections uh, while players uh, are accessing the work. So players don't create the work or create the properties but they are responsible for generating certain things like failures, successes, um, and the over out overall outcomes of the game. So it's probably evident a process-based account highlights the role of the player as a central figure um, for the game. When playing a character, uh, personal identities between the player and player's character do get entangled, forcing a multitude of interesting questions that can be posed such as those regarding personal identity, uh, gender identity, uh, and similar as we heard with music, it's very customary or oftentimes the case that uh, people will explore their own gender identity through gender bending in their characters, especially for those who perhaps feel less empowered at the time to acknowledge or um, be open with their identity. And they'll also explore things like empathy with their characters. Can we empathize with fictional characters? Is a, kind of um, long going uh, question within um, other traditional media, right? And it's certainly true of video games because while it may take us uh, a week to read a novel or two hours to watch a film, oftentimes video games require hours and hours and hours, uh, sometimes years playing and failing and returning to it in order to adequately experience and appreciate it, which means you're spending a lot of time identifying with your player character to some degree or another. And there's lots of lots, lots of ethical questions wrapped up in that, definitely. So for one example, studies have shown that players will, um, uh, uh, again, identify with their character more than themselves to explore their identity um, or perhaps how their behavior makes them feel with certain actions that they choose. But regardless of what character players choose, Given that games involve the self and given the strong degree of control that users have over their characters and game outcomes, uh, you can have students break up into manageable teams and play cooperative role-playing games. And usually this can be anything from five minutes to the full class time, but the more time you give them, the more time you have to observe their behavior as they're playing through certain games, particularly their language and how they identify with their character. So after an adequate uh, enough time goes by, ask the students um, how they talked about their characters. Did they use first person language such as I'm being attacked? This is a phenomenon that has led some philosophers to refer to such games as self involving interactive fictions. The implications of games being self involving is that they potentially place the degree of moral responsibility on the player, not just the characters. Even though it's a fictional um, circumstance, 
players still make uh, real world choices for that fictional game. But what degree, uh, to what degree there should be some moral responsibility or feelings is debatable. So for example, those who play a lot of video games will probably have participated in some form of in-game killing, robbing, deceiving, or much worse. Uh, and you have to, to progress to the next level. What responsibility does a player have for these actions? Some claim that if playing, let's say, Call of Duty, where a player is asked to engage in mass killings, uh, that some degree of lower level guilt should exist if we identify with our characters to any degree, as suggested with the first person language example. Others say that can't be quite right um, because it doesn't quite fit with our language norms or with our various moral philosophies. So for example, maybe first person language is used by your student or yourself. That isn't always, uh, that's not always the case that we use first person. Instead, we sometimes use third person language such as that goblin is attacking my character. And perhaps they speak interchangeably between the perspective, uh, between first and third person. After all, when using first person language, like I'm being attacked, players can often interchange those first person languages that relate specifically to game language, not with ordinary life. So for example, while I'm being attacked uh, does seem self-involving, but I can say I'm being attacked, but I still have high HP, so it's okay. While in first person, this indicates the player is obviously still aware that their actions are directed towards a fictional game world because we don't tend to talk, talk about ourselves in the ordinary life uh, as though we have a health bar above us, right? Or some sort of degree or points that are associated with our well-being in the moment. Um, also, if games were so self-involving uh, and if players are to experience some level of guilt, as with the horrific massacre in Call of Duty, then players should experience some degree of guilt for even lesser offensive actions, such as killing a NPC, non-player character, or guard, right? So if we just simply kill a guard to get to the next level, right, especially if you're playing a lot of video games, that doesn't really impact us in a negative way, but according to the self-involving fictions, it should to some capacity, even at a very low level, right? Or if I decide to steal all the loot from my other parties before they notice that the treasure exists, right? That's sort of reprehen reprehensible behavior. We don't tend to steal in ordinary life. And so if I'm doing that even in game for a fictional world, some of those low level guilts should factor. And maybe sometimes they do depending on the severity of the action or how invested in the narrative and how much it's contributing to the other characters and narrative. So that may happen. But the point being with uh, and against a self-involving fiction is that we, if we play games all the time, we do these sorts of actions, this supposedly um, uh, immoral actions that don't affect the player to a strong degree or even less degree in the ways described. Um, either way, um, students, because they're listening to themselves talking and to each other talking, uh, determining how their actions are affecting not only the moods of their characters, but the moods of the players. Um, there's usually no shortage of discussion uh, when students are prompted to defend uh, either implication, whether they're self-involving or they're a different kind of fiction than has been characterized. All this to say, uh, video games offer philosophers many opportunities for conversations in aesthetics, uh, concepts that are important for game designers, game players, and philosophers, aestheticians, uh, more generally. After all, practicing philosophy in itself is game-like. Uh, importantly, playing is often social. I think the sociality part of it is giving, driving a lot of the value in our play, even individual play. To some degree, we are playing with the traditions of games and game makers. Uh, philosophy is social. Uh, discussions in the classroom should and, and can also embrace this social, sociality and community. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shelby. Uh, do you have any questions to ask? Um, I have a few questions as always. 
I'm full of ideas and questions, but I don't want to really um, take over the scene, so to speak. So I, I have a question if others don't. I, want, I don't want to go again since I went last time if other people do, but. Please do. Okay, uh, hi Shelby. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, very thought provoking. Um, I I love role playing games. Uh, for me, it was like, you know, Final Fantasy series. Like right right before it became like multi massively multi online role playing games. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, MMORPGs. Anyway, so um, cool stuff. So the one thing that I wanted to hear more about um and i think this has a bearing on the siifs um issue that you were talking about um so this a similar thing came up in a community philosophy group meeting recently um we have several trans members and one person made the remark made a joke about how like how many people like how many of us and the way they put it was realize we were trans because of um role playing video games where, as you said, um, there's often considerable latitude for like customizing the gender and other aspects of the embodiment of the the character, the avatar that you're playing as. Um, and it struck me the, the phrasing at the time, and it rem was reminded of that when you were speaking earlier about it. It seemed like a strong way to put it. You know, like it was a very like it was a direct causal claim, and it was I realized this like this game, you know, unlocked this whole other aspect of my selfhood and my identity. Um, and I don't know, it's, it seemed to me at least off the cuff that, that that might suggest that might be some anecdotal evidence in support of the idea that the self-involvement may be deeper and more profound than we're inclined to think in uh, other contexts. What, what do you give any thoughts about that? Yeah, absolutely. No, I, 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 I like that anecdote and it's something that I've encountered by my students and just you know, fellow colleagues who play as well. So I'm a D&D &D person. Um, so I'm constantly role playing certain characters. And I think there's something powerful um, with those characters, uh, more so than getting invested in any sort of uh, characters that are maybe not role playing games. So just kind of tokens that you're, you're controlling and, and using to get certain outcomes or achieve certain outcomes. And I think achievement is in that world and there's some connection or sociality that's happening with the role-playing games. And I do think there's something self-involving. I have not cried so much when I've lost a character as with my role-playing characters. I feel a sense of loss that I failed them. Because in some ways, it's not just that my character failed, Shelby failed because I wasn't able to accomplish what I wanted to or didn't do something well. And I think that that kind of targets that question that some of your students have made of, um, there's something personal that goes from us to our character, especially for creating them from scratch. I think it's sometimes easier to start out role playing by giving a little of yourself and putting a little of your self identity in that character, because then you would, in a true role playing way, know how to behave as opposed to always wanting to do the correct thing to win. You're supposed to do the, the thing that that your character's profile should do regardless of the player knows it's the wrong or right thing. I think that's the beauty of role playing. And with that, I think there's a lot of power that gets thrown into these characters where humans are working out some of their own experiences, own identities, in maybe ways they're not fully aware of. And so that realization becomes very powerful, that aha moment, sometimes hours or weeks after investing into that one character, because you're not always aware that that's how you're, you're working on your character. But I think it's so common and it is something that we can't totally discount that self-involvement, self-involvement with. That's great. Thank you. Well, I have, I have to, I have to ask my question. Um, it's, yeah, there's actually kind of two questions. The first thing I wanted to say is that I, I don't play video games. Last time I tried to play a video game was at my friend's place. Uh, his teenager kids were playing um, NBA um, and I love basketball. I've been playing basketball all my life. 
So I gave it a go, but the players, because you can't imitate a human eye, so however natural they look, however muscular, whatever beautiful movements they have, they look like zombies to me, and it really freaked me out. But I have two questions. The first question is, um, you mentioned on this ethical dimension within uh, the world of gaming and philosophy of, of gaming. Um, and um, I'm wondering if you could tell us if, uh, you know, these scholarship literature on uh, philosophy and ethics of gaming, um, whether they have affected, somehow influenced the gaming industry as such. Uh, because obviously there's a lot of violence, cruelty, and things like that. So it's the first question. Um, and the second question, a uh, more personal one, um, my eldest son, uh, he plays a lot. We live separately, unfortunately. And so he spends a fair bit of time every evening playing uh, PlayStation. And this game that he's playing most of the time is called Roblox, uh, and it's disgusting. I don't. I, I see no value in that whatsoever. And my question is, would you be able to recommend some decent games for someone who is eleven and who is smart but just can't find himself? Yeah. Thanks. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, the first question: ethics. Do do ethics or philosophers in ethics affect video games? I think we're seeing a start with that. Um, video games has not been an academic field long enough, I think, to really uh, see a, a, a huge impact there. I think what's been happening traditionally is a video game will come out. I think the a classic example is um, the Super Columbine Massacre RPG. The game like that will come out and then people absolutely hate it for reasons they don't even know, but it just sounds abhorrent. And so they immediately start going into things like violence and question all sorts of what, what's our behavior? What, what, what are we responsible for? And that sort of does a backwards thing. Well, then philosophers start to think, well, what, what is bad or abhorrent about playing a game like that? And then realizing, actually, maybe there's a big instructional tool that's built into these. We're meant to feel uncomfortable uh, playing these games because violence is horrible. And if we're playing this and all of a sudden feel uncomfortable about how engaging it is, there is a big learning tool there. And um, I teach a whole, sem or whole semester on ethics and games. And my students are always surprised that, of course, everyone's opinionated, but they're surprised, oh, we can be rational human beings about some of these positions and not immediately reactive or emotional about some of these things. And oftentimes violence ends up being a very important tool, not necessarily for just mere entertainment games, right? But oftentimes violence is used in a positive way. But again, it has non-gamer uh, people worried that somehow it's trying to promote or glorify that violence. But I think we're going to see more impact of ethics into games rather than just games uh, fueling people like me to talk about it. But we're slow going. Roadblocks. Everyone's playing roadblocks. I have two sons as well. Um, uh, it, de it depends if that's his style of game. I mean, there's all sorts of fun ones, Terraria, Undertale. Uh, a lot of those games end up just being social social opportunities. So I think chats are very dangerous, especially for, for kids, depending on who what community they're in. But there is a great advantage to um, connecting with other people while playing games. And I think uh, strategy games like Terraria, Undertale, Minecraft, if that's if that's a similar thing. Um, there's a lot of spatial skills, social skills, math. My uh, Both my kids are excellent at math because of Dungeons and Dragons. Or at least uh, it, it kind of fueled that, that kind of thinking as well as narrative and, and storytelling. So there's tons of games out there, but really, uh, yeah, you want to find one that's just not mindless. Right. The idea is that there's some sort of improvement. I totally get that. So good luck. Maybe I can message you more ideas as I think of them. Yeah, yeah. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Yeah. We Thank have, you. Yeah, yeah. We have time for one more question if uh, anyone is up, uh, if anyone is uh, curious about something. Um, if not, we'll move. Oh, yep. Yeah. Please, Carlos. Thanks so much, Shelby, and thanks for that presentation. It's so fascinating. I'm just curious, it's a quick question, um, uh, about the intersection between video games and art. Um, 
I I um recently there um there's been yeah a few like artistic productions that integrate um role playing and but along the lines of like making a, obviously a satirical comment but very real about um <clears throat> roles like um a Wal Walmart uh, employee or um uh, a Starbucks employee and so forth um, recently, there was an artist um, from Mexico that uh, features in the Whitney Biennial. I forget his name, um, and it was all about that, like, in, like pretty much creating an, an artwork um, that was clearly interactive, immersive, but making a comment about, um, I guess, the the realities of um, being an, uh, exploited um, in these employee roles. That's just one example, but in general, like. Um, I'm just wondering the, about the intersection between video games and, and art. Yeah, that's an that's an excellent question, and it's it's a highly debatable one. I'm I'm of the camp that thinks video games can be candidates for art. They don't have to be. I find no reason why they they shouldn't be, and not just because of the perceptual features, as I was talking about with genre, right? I think most of the artistic aesthetic experiences come from those outcomes, like you were just describing, empathy for a Walmart. Walmart worker or, or whatever the case may be, maybe it's um, inclusion, right, or accepting other cultures or communities. And I think a lot of people push back on this idea of the artness because there's so much instrumentality involved in it, um, right? Or if you're, you know, not only are you doing, trying to achieve things because it is a game, but in addition to that, if there's a critical outcome that you're trying to get, well, is that separate from the artistic experience or appreciation? Big debate. I think how I would answer that is this idea of the illusory attitude. So the idea that we're adopting something, we're adopting a certain attitude when we play a game and in a sim similar way, we're doing this in a disinterested way as Kant would want us to with artworks. So that illusory attitude is the umbrella. And in that, I feel like we can appreciate it as, it's, as an art nested within that illusory attitude might be achievement, learning a skill, might be appreciation for the Walmart employee, might be all sorts of other things. Uh, but because of that illusory attitude, I feel like it can lend itself very well to appreciation in the same way we would appreciate a painting, not the same way, but in similar manner, right, that we can appreciate traditional arts just on a very interactive, immersive level, if that if that answers what you were getting at. Yeah, 